welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Kiri Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce today's special guest. I'm happy to announce that I'm working on my next book. The title is Reclaim Your Digestive Health and Feel Normal Again, Fixing the Root Cause of Your GI Distress with Natural Treatments. Now this book should be ready later this year, so keep an eye out for it. Okay, that's it for housekeeping, so let's get started. Okay, so today's show we're going to go back to talking about gut health and digestive health, and we're having our expert back on for a second interview. This is Dr. Michael Ruscio. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Now, Dr. Ruscio is a doctor, a researcher, author, and health enthusiast. Uh, He practices functional medicine, and he is currently performing two clinical trials in the treatment of digestive conditions, and he is also writing a book on the microbiota, or the good bacteria. Dr. Ruscio gives smart, busy people who are suffering from symptoms of chronic illness simple steps to get better and get on with life. And he will also be a featured speaker at the upcoming SIBO Symposium for 2016. Dr. Ruscio, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Hi, thanks so much for having me back. So I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ruscio, about just talking about the gut more because there's just so much information, exciting information coming out these days about gut health, bacteria, the brain-gut connection. But I was hoping today you could kind of take us back a little, take us like two steps a little bit back and talk about the two different gut types that you have found Sure, sure. And, and and thank you for asking the question. And uh, it's a very timely question, I think, because this is something I've been struggling with as I've been writing the book and trying to take the reader through all this different stuff, right? Fiber, good or bad. Um, prebiotics, good or bad. Antibiotics, good or bad. Antimicrobial herbs, good or bad. Anti-inflammatory herbs, good or bad. Do I have IBS? Do I have SIBO? Do I maybe have uh, low-level Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or ulcers? So um, there's a lot of stuff here to to, to sort through and and to weigh out. And I was uh, thinking about this and kind of taking a big step back and, and reflecting upon what I noticed in the clinic. And I think we can break this down into, as you said, two gut types. And and the way I'm terming them, at least for right now until I can find maybe better language, is the out-of-shape gut type compared to the injured gut type. And it's kind of uh, an exercise um, analogy, but here's what this typically looks like. If someone is just out of shape, they could simply exercise and increase their fitness. However, if someone has a really bad knee injury, they probably couldn't go right into running three miles a day or doing squats or doing lunges until they rehabbed that knee injury. And in fact, if they tried just going right into exercise without doing rehab, they'd probably make their injury worse. So this is how I look at gut types. There is the out of shape gut, if you will, that just needs exercise and exercise would be predominantly uh, fibers and prebiotics. So this is someone that could increase their fiber intake, they could increase their prebiotic intake, or they could supplement with fiber and or prebiotics. And they're going to see their gut function improve. If they have a little bit of gas, it gets better. If they're a little bit constipated, that gets better. If they're, if they have loose stools, that gets better. Um, now that's kind of the easy case, the, the, the easy gut. 
the injured gut, if this person really increases their fiber intake significantly or their prebiotic intake, they may notice they get worse. They have worsening diarrhea or worsening constipation or worsening of their bloating or what have you. Because they're, again, analogous to having an injury and they need to rehab the injury before going right into exercise. Um, does that make sense so far? Absolutely. And I know a lot of our listeners out there, you know, just like a lot of your patients, they're very internet savvy. They're out there listening to podcasts, reading blog posts, and they think they're doing the right things. And they try fibers or they try prebiotics or probiotics, and then they start feeling worse. So I love this analogy that you use with an injured knee that needs rehab before you really get back into shape. Precisely. And I, I think it's uh, unfortunate that you know we we can read a lot of interesting stuff on the internet about these really interesting things we're learning about maybe studies done in Africa or what have you and and how the Africans are eating a really high fiber diet and the Africans are really healthy and then it's easy for us to extrapolate well you know my my name is Mary Sue I'm a mother of two in my mid forties and I live in uh, you know Kansas and I have a lot of constipation and I'm a little bit overweight and so I want to try to really go on this strong fiber and prebiotic supplement and see if that helps me by you know making my gut more like the Africans improving the good bacteria and therefore making me healthy it's a very appealing concept but as you said Dr. Carey unfortunately what happens in a lot of cases is that can make people worse uh, it can make some people better, but um, I'm hoping that this message more so reaches the people that have tried something like that and noticed that they've gotten worse. And for these people, there may be, or, or the injury, what the injury may be, could be something like SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth like we've talked about. Uh, and there could also be inflammatory bowel disease, something like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Those are the two things that I find most commonly are at the root cause of why people don't do better when they up their fiber intake or they uh, sometimes even go on a probiotic or, or go on a prebiotic. Okay, so talk a little bit about inflammatory bowel disease because I think a lot of listeners don't realize you could have a low level of inflammation, but it's not um, easily diagnosed cl clinically in a, in a typical doctor's office. And so then sure. you're kind of told like, oh, it's just IBS or something. Sure. And, and you're absolutely right. There are the, the, the cases of inflammatory bowel disease, typically they manifest, but not always, typically manifest as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. These are probably what people have heard. Uh, they may have a family member or a friend that has ulcerative colitis or, or Crohn's. Um, and interestingly, what happens, uh, part of what happens um, in inflammatory bowel disease is the immune system starts actually attacking some of the bacteria in the gut. And this may be why approaches that really robustly feed bacteria like prebiotics and fiber can sometimes make inflammatory bowel disease worse. Because um, even though some of what we're hearing with this new uh, wave of research regarding the microbiota seems to suggest we all need more bacteria, right? You know, we've taken antibiotics. We don't need healthy food. We don't need enough probiotic rich foods. We don't have enough exposure to dirt and, and stuff like that. So, you know, Westerners tend to be deficient in bacteria. So therefore, to fix that, we need more bacteria. Well, that's not always the case. And inflammatory bowel disease is one of those cases where people have a tendency to attack their own bacteria. So, Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are, are two. Um, however, there are also types that can elude uh, what would be, you know, more of your classical endoscopy or colonoscopy examination that a gastroenterologist would perform. And this is a, a subset of inflammatory bowel disease, disease, excuse me, known as microscopic colitis. And these can only be determined via a biopsy. And then there's even sometimes when the microscopic colitis is what's called indeterminate, and it's diagnosed as indeterminate colitis, meaning even from the biopsy, we can't really tell. And then there are inflammatory markers in the blood and autoimmune markers in the blood that can be run to verify that. Now, what that comes down to when we're trying to 
be practical and okay, you know, what what do we do with that information to become healthier? Well, why that's important is it gives us clues as to what we should do and what we shouldn't do to help someone improve the health of their gut. And again, coming back to fiber as an example, it's been very well established that high fiber diets can make inflammatory bowel disease worse, especially when someone's in a flare. And so a lot of times what this can end up looking like is initially someone is trying to improve their health. So they've been eating much more vegetables and maybe they're eating much more raw vegetables because they've heard about how the enzymes are intact and and what have you. But this person is noticing that they are getting really bloated and they're having several stools a day that are somewhat loose. And in the clinic, when they come in and we do some testing, we figure out that they have this low level inflammatory bowel disease uh, via blood testing or stool testing that we can do. And so we have them go on a low fiber diet for a short period of time. And these people tend to see dramatic improvement in how they feel. And we give that a few months. We allow the gut to heal. We allow the symptoms to start to quell. So their bowels are more formed. They are having less bloating or abdominal pain. Uh, They're going to the bathroom less. Instead of going to the bathroom four or five, six times a day, they're going to the bathroom once or twice a day. And then we slowly have them increase their fiber intake slowly and gradually and settle into a level of fiber intake that seems to be appropriate for them. And so that process is kind of like the um, the rehab process. Uh, and there are some other things that may go along with that. There are certain probiotics that work really well for inflammatory bowel disease. And there are some herbs that work really well for inflammatory bowel disease, some anti-inflammatory herbs, things like curcumin, boswellia, uh, artemisinin has been studied. Uh, and then another thing I should mention is one of the things that has been noticed in conventional medicine and observation is that antibiotics can actually induce remission of many cases of inflammatory bowel disease. Probably because like we talked about a minute ago, part of what happens in inflammatory bowel disease is your immune system is attacking your good bacteria. So if we can decrease the numbers, even of good bacteria in this case, there's less for the immune system to attack. There's less to aggravate the immune system. So Interestingly, there are herbs that are both antibiotic in nature and anti-inflammatory. Artemisinin is one, I think, of the most notable that's been shown to work well for inflammatory bowel disease and also work well as an antibacterial and antiparasitic agent that has nice applications um, f- you know, for this, uh, for this uh, regard. But I would also caution people not to use artemisinin which is a derivative of wormwood without their doctor's supervision because in high doses for too long, it can start to have negative impacts. So this is not something I would say go online and buy a six-month supply of artemisinin and start taking it in high doses. Um, So those are just some of the initial items that are important that come to mind. Um, I apologize if that was a bit of a scattered rant, but hopefully some, (laughs) some helpful information came through there. Well, what I heard come through and what I think the listeners um, understood is that it goes back to the individual person and figuring out what diet works best for them. And just as you were saying, sometimes more fiber is not enough and you need to do less. And figuring out what fibers are best for you and what fibers are your enemies, let's say. And Mm -hmm. same thing with probiotics. What probiotics work for you or what probiotics are your enemies? And that sometimes antibiotics are your friend. They can be, yeah. And I think what what can be challenging for a patient is they almost feel guilty or like something's wrong with them if they don't feel better on more fiber. And they're thinking, well, geez, everyone says how healthy fiber is. You know, why am I not getting healthier on more fiber? I should just keep eating more and keep eating more. And there are some patients that have just been struggling and, and inadvertently making themselves worse because they think that there's this you know strong stereotype statement that we can make that everyone should be eating more fiber um but that's not always the case we we want to try to get someone on a diet that's higher in healthy vegetables and fruits but we also have to as you said individualize it per the person so going back to these two gut types the out of shape type and the injured type 
Where do you think something like biofilms would fit into this idea? Mm, that's a great question. Biofilms, I would say, could fall into either one, but there's there's more of a tendency for the biofilm to fall into the injured gut. Um, and the reason why I would classify it more in the injured gut is because biofilms typically form when there has been a imbalance or an overgrowth that has been present for a long period of time. Um, biofilms, so maybe to take, to take a step back and define biofilms, when bacteria are in the body, they initially are in a, a free form known as planktonic, just picture like plankton bits, you know, or in the ocean just kind of flowing freely. And then with time, as bacteria find their niche, so to speak, they start to kind of clump together and, and form a little colony. And as they start forming this colony, they start to creating this protective layer known as a biofilm. And good bacteria can actually also form biofilms. So biofilms are not universally bad. Um, however, what makes biofilms problematic is that when a bad bacteria uh, or fungus gets into the body and is there for a prolonged period of time, it can then start to form this biofilm, which makes the bacteria or fungal colony resistant to treatment. And this, I think this is most notably seen actually with candida. This is where I've seen it most notably, where someone has candida, it's treated, they start feeling better, their symptoms start improving, and then over the course of a few months, they start to relapse back to where they were before. Uh, so we had a little bit of a technical glitch there. I'll try to pick back up right where we left off. But essentially, uh, what this can look like, uh, like I was saying, was when um, someone does have a biofilm, typically with fungus, this is where I see it more often, um, then they will get better from treatment, their symptoms in their labs will improve, and then they will relapse over the course of a few months. And that's when during retreatment using a biofilm or a, a biofilm uh, destructing um, agent can be helpful and, and can help with getting over um, the infection. Although I should mention there's one type of bacteria where the biofilm agents – do seem to have efficacy, and that is with um, H. pylori bacteria, the bacteria that can uh, reside or that resides in the stomach and can cause uh, ulcers or, or uh, in some cases, high or low stomach acid depending on the, the type of H. pylori and the location. There was one notable study where um, two groups of patients were treated for H. pylori with antibiotics, and one, tr one group got an antibiotic plus an acetylcysteine, which is an anti-biofilm agent, and the success rate of clearing the H. pylori bacteria was remarkably higher in the group receiving the N-acetylcysteine along with the antibiotic compared to the other group. So there are certainly some applications. Um, some that treat Lyme disease use antibiofilm agents. Lyme is a little bit outside of my area of specialty, so I can't really speak to Lyme. Um, but from a gut perspective, for H. pylori, certainly, and for fungus, definitely. For intestinal bacteria, it's still a little bit unclear, and we're, um, we're collecting data on that right now to try to answer it more definitively. But we haven't collected enough data yet to really be able to report numbers that carry significance. So um, the jury's still out on that one, I guess. Okay, so um, the next thing I wanted to ask you was about the gut-brain connection, the brain-gut connection. There's more and more info coming out these days about the vagus nerve and how that can impact our digestive health. The, the connection between the gut and the brain, the brain and the gut is – very interesting, and I, I think one of the one of the questions I ask myself is is one of these is one of the directions more important than the other? Meaning, uh, does the gut have more of an impact on the brain, or does the brain have more of an impact on the gut? Because that would steer how you would treat a patient, right? What kind of therapy would you want to do? Would you want to focus on like a brain based therapy? Um, and this might be things that are uh, stimulating the 
the vagal nerve or the vagal nuclei uh, or just stimulating the kind of relaxation response, which um, a lot of digestion is is parasympathetic or your relaxation division of your nervous system mediated. Um, so if the brain was having most of the impact on the gut or, or a more significant impact on the gut, then we may want to start with brain therapies first. If the gut was having more of an impact on the brain, then we may want to start with gut therapies first. And what I've noticed clinically is it certainly seems to be that the gut has more of an impact on the brain. And I think there's there's one exception to this, which is people that have had head traumas or have been under extraordinary amounts of stress and maybe have created neurological imbalances. Um, th these are people who, to give a kind of arbitrary example, they may, uh, if they stand up straight, close their eyes, they may lose their balance very, very easily. Um, they have people that have really frank neurological imbalances or, or head trauma. Um, those people may do better with brain therapies, but um, what I've noticed is that um, the the brain exercises I haven't noticed to be super helpful for people with gut issues. Now, I should also mention that um, these are not things I do much of in the clinic. I am just taking this based upon conversations I've had with other clinicians who kind of do both and from the fact that I focus on treating the gut, not on treating the brain. And I've seen a number of patients who have gone to doctors that kind of start with the brain and haven't been able to get the results. So I may be seeing a little bit of a, of a biased sample of, of a, a sample of people that need gut work. But uh, in looking at a lot of the literature, I, I think a lot of the a lot of the imbalance occurs in the gut because we want to treat where the imbalance is. And if we look at both or if, if we compare the gut and the brain, which one has an environment that would be more insulting to the th than the other? And I really think it's our guts because we use antibiotics uh, so often and so early in life because our food supply is so poor because we're deficient in exposure to dirt and animals, uh, kind of like our, our hunter-gatherer uh, predecessors had that, that we don't have. All of this really creates an environment that's very unhealthy for the gut. Certainly, one can make an argument that we're under a lot of stress, and that's not good for the brain, yes. But I think if we, had a, if we compare these two, the gut is under much more insult in the brain. And I think that's why starting with the brain as a therapy, I'm sorry, starting with the gut as a therapy is really the best way to go. But they, they do both influence one another. Okay. And then I know this last question, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but um, as, as uh, I, I said during our uh, introduction, uh, I noticed that you are going to be one of the featured speakers at the upcoming SIBO symposium this year. Can you give us a little glimpse as to what you might be speaking about? And for the listeners out there, the SIBO Symposium has been done every year. This will be the third annual symposium. And uh, for the most part, the symposium is put together for doctors, but actually a lot of lay people um, do, uh, do come to the symposium. Yes, it, it's it's attended by both lay people and and uh, nutritionists, health coaches, and all different types of uh, physicians. Um, and it, it's been a, a great event. It's been one of my favorite uh, conferences to to attend and and this year to be a part of. Um, I'll be doing a couple different segments. One will be on the data that we've been collecting regarding biofilm treatment to see if when treating SIBO, if we also treat with biofilm agents, if that enhances the success of SIBO treatment. Um, and we're also looking at a, um, a natural prokinetic known as Iberogast and its ability to prevent relapse in SIBO. And so we'll be presenting on that also. Um, and there's a third topic I'll be speaking on. And I actually forget off the top of my head <laughs> which one that is. Um, I have we have a lot of things going on, so I, f I forget what the third component is. But I will be addressing biofilms, <laughs> prokinetics, um, and then the third is actually uh, escaping me at the moment. But it's going to be a surprise. It'll be good. <laughs> it'll be a surprise for me too. 
<laughs> oh, well, it's that's really my fault because I kind of put you on the spot there with that question. <laughs> it's okay. It's no problem at all. I mean, it'll all be in the, the program for the symposium, which I think is already online. Um, so if, if people – if you just search SIBO Symposium 2016, you can pull up the program and it, it has a schedule with the, the different speakers and what they'll be speaking about. And it should be should be a really good event. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So if you want to know some of the latest information on SIBO, I highly recommend you attend the symposium. And this is one of the symposiums that you can attend online, live streaming. It has made attending seminars so much easier, hasn't it, Dr. Rochelle? I know. I know. It really has. <laughs> I was just attending a seminar this weekend in my pajamas all weekend, just in front of my computer. Didn't have to fly anywhere. It was wonderful. It is. It is nice. I I do one or two uh, seminars uh, a year in, in person and the rest I prefer to do at home because it is just so much easier to not have to fly and be hassled and, and all that. But I will say that the SIBO Symposium was was worth it because the food in in Oregon is excellent and it was a really fine group of people. So that's that's one of the few that I I make the trek out, but I totally agree with you. Being able to uh telecommute so to speak makes it so much easier. Okay, so again for the listeners out there, Dr. Ruscio did such a great job today explaining the two gut types, the out of shape type, the injured type. So really the take home message that I'd like you to uh take from this is just no matter what gut problem you're having, is to have hope that there is a reason that it's happening. There's a cause. All it is is about figuring out the cause. Um, Dr. Ruscio, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has just been another awesome interview. My pleasure. Thanks again for having me. All right. That wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Dr. Michael Ruscio. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show next week. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Kerry is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Kerry is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next Next week with more from Dr. Carey.